Welcome to the Coach's Table Podcast, where coaches come to grow personally and professionally through real-world application and online education. What is going on today? Man, beautiful day, sun is shining, life is good. Um, It's chaotic in college sports right now, which is good and bad, right? I mean, everybody's ramping up um, and ramping down for about a week off or so. So if you're in the college sports world right now, you know that you're getting ready to get a break for about five days, maybe a week at max, and then you're into fall camp, you're into whatever it is you're into. That's both football, that's basketball. I mean, everybody's getting going. This is also um, such a fun time of the year, man. I mean, August is right around the corner, but what's great too is like college football is coming, you know? Now we get football four, five days, six days a week, which is amazing, Um, and I'm excited for that because I think everybody loves football season. I really, really, really do. So, but guys, hey, look, here's the deal. Um, the guest I'm going to bring on is uh, a very intelligent man. He's he's written an article or two, and, and we're going to have a fantastic conversation. I'm super pumped for him to be on. But do us a huge favor. Um, share the show. Okay, we're growing rapidly. All, that's my ask for you. We're growing rapidly both on Spotify and on YouTube. And the only way this show grows is if you share it. So if you get anything from this, if you get, oh, man, that's a great point. Man, I'm, I'm going to implement that myself. I got educated. I got entertained. Or, hey, somebody else needs to hear this because it's beneficial. Do me a huge favor. Share the show. That's all that I ask. So without f- further ado, uh, my guy, Mr. Michael Gregg. What's up, man? Hey, hey, Kendrick. Great to have Great to be on. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. I uh, look forward to chatting for a little bit. So Yeah, man. I'm excited, man. Um, you know, you were rec- – like I told you before, but, you know, you were recommended by – several people. Um, and I always love that because it's like, there's a common theme, you know? Um, and, and I think that's a, a testament to, you know, who you are, of what you stand for, how you kind of operate, not only the people that you work with on a daily basis, notice that, but maybe people from afar, maybe people that only had a couple of conversations with you and it stuck with them. And I think that's really important. Um, I think that's something that maybe a lot of people should kind of think about for a second. Like, what if we only have one conversation, you know? This episode is sponsored by Team Builder. Team Builder is the number one performance platform for strength coaches around the world. Their software provides coaches with an elevated experience when it comes to program development, data tracking, and staying connected with athletes and clients. Coaches also have access to consultations with Team Builder's in-house sports scientists to help them manage and analyze data. Head to teambuilder.com and sign up with promo code TABLE to start your 30-day free trial. That's Team Builder, T-E-A-M-B-U-I-L-D-R.com with promo code TABLE to start your free 30-day trial. Coaches, this podcast is sponsored by Samsung Equipment. They have been providing elite strength training equipment and professional weight room solutions since 1976. If you value product quality, Great customer service and a company with integrity makes Samsung Equipment your go-to. Visit them at samsungequipment.com and let them know the Coach's Table podcast gave you a seat at their table. That is Samsung Equipment, S-A-M-S-O-N, equipment.com, and let them know the Coach's Table podcast gave you a seat at their table. (laughs) How does that stick in somebody's mind, right? Like, good or bad? Yeah, and no, I think that's glad. something that you've done a good job of. Well, good. I'm glad glad to hear that. I think it's cool that you know people think of me that way. But uh, hopefully, like you said, you know, they just think that maybe I'm pouring into them and making a little small difference. Um, yeah, if I can do that to a whole bunch of different people. Then that that makes me feel good, and that's that's what I live for. So that's good. Yeah, man. What's up? So how's uh, how's summer training going? It's great. It's great. We only got uh, I guess next week and, and and half a week, and then we'll give our guys a few days off, uh, and then reporting day is August fourth. So uh, it's rapidly coming to an end, but we've had an awesome summer. Uh, the way we do it here is, um, yeah. you know, everybody that – our football guys, at least, everyone that trains here in the summer, they're here voluntarily. Um, and we only have about 25 guys of a roster of 130. Um, so every morning at 7 a.m., I've got a group of about 25 or 30 guys uh, that choose to be there that go to work right after because they're, they're you know, working a job in the afternoons to be able to fund themselves being here. And yeah. So they're investing in themselves to be here, which I think is awesome. Yeah. And, uh, then I'm just communicating with all the guys all across the country, almost on a daily basis to see uh, where they're at, what they're doing, uh, making sure that they're going to show up ready to go. So we're only about, you know, two and a half weeks out from that. 
Man, two and a half weeks out. That's crazy, huh? Yeah, it's wild. It Man. comes quick every year. Yo, it does, doesn't it? I was yeah. just talking to someone the other day, and it's like, um, you know, when the winter comes, you're like, oh, man, the days get longer, they get darker uh, earlier, right, and colder. And it's like as soon as that summer hits, let's call it, I don't know, May, it just seems May, June, July, August just seem to fly. And yeah. you're just like, it's a blink of an eye. And you're like, dude, what the heck happened? Like, yeah. did I even get to, like, really enjoy my summer? <laughs> or, like, what? Exactly right. I looked up, and it was June, and looked up again, and it's almost August. So. Yeah, I mean, like, July right. is – what's up? And I'm ready for football season, though. That's that's you know I love that it's coming. How y'all looking this year? Uh, man, we're we're steady. We're consistent. You know, every year, um, you know, we're fighting for nine, ten, eleven wins. We're fighting to get in the playoffs. We want to make a deep playoff run every year. I, I see no reason why we shouldn't make a deep playoff run. Uh, it's not even making an appearance in the national championship. Uh, that's yeah, our objective to be in McKinney, Texas, um, in, in December. So, um, heck yeah, we got, we got the dudes. It's just can we align our dudes with you know everything that we need to do to, to get there on a daily basis. So. Heck yeah, man. Because you also played football there. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, I played football here from 2013. My last season was 2017. I was getting my grad degree um, in that year. But yeah. yeah, yeah, I had a few good runs. In 16, we were what, quarterfinalists. In 17, uh, we were semifinalists in the in the playoffs. So, um, and it's, it's a blast. It's fun around here. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. That was uh, when I was playing college ball. The 2013 year, yeah, the fall of 2013, we, like, it's very similar. Um, we won our conference and then uh, made a quarterfinal run. Uh, unfortunately, we lost, right? But that was it. But, um, yeah, it was good, man. It, 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 it was good, you know. So, but, so when you got done playing, mm -hmm. did you – just move into a role right away then or did you go to a couple places and then came back yeah so when i was finished playing in 2017 i'd already put out like a bunch of you know applied for a bunch of internships all over the place of course uh, so ended up deciding uh this, i guess january of 2018 um to go to tcu as an intern um, heck yeah let's go go frogs man i yeah. love tcu yeah i love tcu i to work with all their sports programs you know back then everybody was under uh don summer uh, the head guy at the time, uh, he yep. had football, uh, so yep. got you know got to work with football and owe a lot to Don Summer, but also got to learn under Zach Dakin over there. Um, yeah, I love Zach. He's really such a sport. Yeah, without a doubt, like that that was an awesome learning experience. Um, you know, fast forward, you know, four months, I ended up you know getting offered to be a GA there. Um, so stick around through the summer, and I'm a GA there for a year, um, and then I guess the, you know from July to July, I'm a GA, and then. Ended up getting a call to go to Northern Arizona to take over their men and women's basketball programs as an assistant. Yeah. I worked in football there. Uh, owe a lot to Sam Lackey and Jake Bueller yep. um, to, to help me out, get my feet uh, running with, with men and women's basketball up there. Um, and I was there, you know, through COVID. And then I got a call, um, you know, kind of the fall of 2020. Um, Division two didn't have a season uh, in the fall or the spring. Uh, mm -hmm. Got a call from our head coach. Uh, head football coach asking if I would be interested. Uh, and then I get a call from uh, somebody on the academic side, that, you know, explains that they're starting a master's program in strength and conditioning. Uh, and Harding had never had a strength and conditioning coach before. Uh, they had had, you know, strength coaches that had worked with teams individually, but nobody that was ever like over all the sports. Sure. So they were creating a role uh, that would obviously work closely with football and, and all in every sport, uh, but to oversee, um, you know, just like a regular head strength coach role and uh, also kind of be a mentor to uh, individuals in the masters of uh, strength conditioning program. That yeah. Starting. So uh, ended up accepting that role, came in in the uh, spring of 21 and the master's program started the fall of 21 and uh, we've been rolling ever since. So, man, man, that's crazy. First of all, TCU is beautiful. I love it. Fort Worth is amazing. Um, Wish I'd never moved out of there and could move back there. I love that area. And then Northern Arizona too, man. That that's Flagstaff, right? Yes, it's Flagstaff. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful there, man. That's and the facilities there are fantastic. Yeah, so I was I was there uh, you know, right as we were kind of designing that that weight room. Uh, yeah. So so me and Sam Lackey and Jake Bueller all kind of put our, our two cents in and then uh, I ended up leaving. You know, right as you know, kind of the, all the beams and, and construction was starting, 
Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. so I got to see, um, I got to see the end result of it. It looks awesome. It's beautiful. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, okay. So then you, you get to Harding, mm-hmm. you know, in the spring, get you, you know, get settled in, right. Go through the summer and then, you know, the fall comes and the master's program starts. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of walk us through because I think, well, one, because the article that you wrote, it kind of talks a lot, a little bit about this, right, the process of it. So you've been there for three years now. So let's go back to, you know, year one or, or year zero, however people want to call it, whatever. Um, how did you kind of start? Because I think this is so important for coaches that are not at massive universities, right? And so if you're a one or two man show, if you're a three man show and you've got 15 sports or whatever the case may be, how did you kind of start to one develop the relationships? Not only, I mean, you knew the head coach, but on the academic side to say, Hey, look, like if we're going to do this, we got to do this right. We need equipment, staff, personnel, um, you know, working with, how did you kind of work with the master's program and everything like that? And what was the struggles of year one? Uh, compared to year two, I know I asked 15 questions there, but yeah, just kind no, of talk us through it. Yeah, I think a couple of things that helped me tremendously was already having the relationships in place when I got there. Um, sure. You know, the the kind of the head of the, the academic side, Brian Phillips, I, I, he was one of my professors when I was doing exercise science here. Gotcha. He knew me. He knew my work ethic. He watched me play football. Uh, that helped tremendously. And obviously, I knew uh, our athletic director, Coach Morgan, was also the basketball coach, so I knew him well. I knew Paul Simmons and the entire football staff really, really well. Uh, so they could all vouch for me just from a character standpoint and a work sure. standpoint. They knew what I was made of. What they didn't know is just, you know, I guess my qualifications as a strength coach. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I also think we we're fortunate to have the facilities that we have. You know, mm. uh, that was something that I didn't have to fret over too much when I first got here. You know, our football has their own uh, facility. Uh, yeah. We've got three other weight rooms that service the rest of our, our athletics teams. Um, and so really it was my issue with facilities was I couldn't be in two or three places at the same time, you know, so yeah. football wanted to train, uh, you know, in the afternoon. Um, and I also was working with softball at the time, I had to just, you know, make sure that one finished and I could get beat at another place right sure. after scheduling issues, I guess. Uh, so that first spring that I was here, it was just me. Uh, and, and coming in, what I, I said, like, Hey, I, I need some, somebody or, you know, with me. And so the, the original plan was to have like a part term, part time assistant uh, hired, you know, within the first year. Sure. Well, I started kind of running the numbers and realized like, well, that that's just me and one other person for four hundred student athlete. That's going to be tough um, with all the facilities. Yeah. So I pitched the idea to have graduate assistants. And at first, you know, I was just thinking, hey, if we can get two GAs in here, uh, we'll be in good shape. Um, and eventually, um, just through multiple conversations, um, we ended up with four. Grad, grad assistants. Wow. Um, Four, that helps a lot. Yeah, that helped tremendously, especially on that first, that first ball here. Yeah. Uh, and that was just, you know, talking with the dean of Allied Health, uh, Dr. McGallard here, and to be able to, you know, just outline what the vision of the, the department was and yep. how much better we could operate. Uh, and it helped because we were able to get more students in the master's program. Um, and that just helps on the, the bottom line budgeting side of things. You know? Yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> And then, you know, once once they agreed to that, the biggest struggle was just bringing people in, which was, you know, kind of the probably the biggest task my first summer was finding four grad assistants. So using my connections and, and just posting and reaching out to people. Um, and then, you know, the first fall, I didn't know what I didn't know. I knew that um, every boss I'd had always said, like, you don't realize like, how heavy the, the head guy chair is until you're actually in it. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I certainly could have done a much better job, like setting my GAs up for success and preparing them. But uh, I kind of followed the path of just, you know, um, let my GAs learn the way that I did. And when I was a GA, it was very much like, hey, as long as, you know, you don't cause the head guy any issues um, and you take care of your teams and nobody gets hurt, you're going to be in good shape. And in my mind, yes. that's just kind of how it was as a GA. GA comes in, they know how to do everything. Um, and my learning experience was, no, that they, they, they require a lot of development very much like a, like a, you know, a brand new intern does. The issues are just different. You know, an intern, you might have to teach him what a barbell is versus a dumbbell versus a J hook versus a safety bar. Uh, for, for a GA, you, they really need to understand how to interact with the coaches. 
Um, mm. They've never had those meetings before. They need to interact uh, with student athletes and how to deal with student athletes from various different backgrounds. Those are things as an intern that they weren't exposed to uh, at a lot of places. A lot of places are um, helping their interns be exposed to those things. Uh, so those are things from year one to year two that I feel like I did a good job of. Yeah. All right, we need to have a couple meetings through the summer before the GAs get here. Um, so they at least feel exposed to what they're going to see um, in their first week, two weeks, first month here uh, working with us. So um, I don't know if I answered all your questions, but I think. I hit- <laughs> yeah, I know. I tend to ask like 15 questions because it's always like, well, this and then turn into that, you know, whatever. But no, I think so. I think that's one thing, you know, that you really hit on too from from that standpoint of like, you know, when everybody goes back to being an intern, right? <clears throat> And for some, that was a long time ago, and for some, that wasn't. But, you know, you only see, like, what's happening on the floor. And for full-time coaches, the fun time for us is, like, when we're on the floor coaching, right? Like, that's easy for us. Like, and I don't mean easy, but I mean, like, you're like, okay, cool. This is the only thing I have to worry about right now. When you get off the floor that you may not have the – as an intern and, and even some graduate assistants, you may not have this, but you don't go and work with sport coaches. You don't have the emails to answer. You don't have the reports to run and write and to dive into some stuff and be like, hey, coach, this, this, and that. You don't have the adjustments of practice. You don't have to go to practice. You don't have – so, you, like, as an intern, you're like, yo, I can do this. This is easy. Like, okay, but you're not writing the program. You're not – you know what I'm saying? And then, so and I could totally see that how – when developing graduate assistants, you say, hey, problems are similar, but they're different. You know, now I get to mentor you on how to work with sport coaches, how to influence them, how to gain rapport with them, how to do things of that nature, which is going to either greatly help you or really make your life pretty tough, you know? Um, yeah, I think and- you know- I'm, th- I'm thinking back as a GA, and I had two very opposite experiences. The sure. thing I was directly responsible for was swim and dive. Uh-huh. And the sport coach, um, James Winchester, did a better job of any coach I've ever worked with just bringing me in and making me feel like part of a team. Like part of mm. the, you know, he made me feel like I was an assistant coach for the swim team uh, when, you know, really at very minimum, all I had to do was be in the weight room for three hours a week or whatever it was. Uh, but being able to be at sport practices and, and warm them up and him, you know, have me travel and eat with the team and meet with recruits was incredible. My other team was track and field. And, you know, I, my biggest headache was, you know, the players or the, the, the sprinters will come in the afternoon and they'll say, hey, that said this, this, that and this. And, you know, I'd hear just nothing from the athletic trainer for weeks yeah. at a time. Yeah. As a GA, I was pointing fingers and like, wasn't this guy? He, he never communicates, never tells me anything. And I don't, I don't remember who I learned it from, but it basically is a huge realization in my eyes that like, hey, if I ever, uh, ex- you know, I should never expect somebody to communicate to me. I should always be the one seeking the information, you know, mm-hmm. so I made it a habit from then on. Like, if I'm not going to see him at practice, if, you know, he's not going to come in the weight room, then I'm going to go and, and visit with the athletic trainer. Um, or, you know, if a player says like, Hey, you know, I hurt my hamstring today, this is what so-and-so said, then I'm at least going to send him a text so that we're on the same page. Or I'm going to call him immediately just, just to make sure that I'm the one doing the communicating. Um, yeah. and that's yeah. something that has been incredibly important, uh, for us here at Harding, especially something I've tried to instill in the GAs is you've got to be the one communicating. If you ever find yourself frustrated because you don't have the information that you think you needed, it's hundred percent on you. It has nothing to do with them. Um, and I think we've had a lot of success with that in the last two years. I think that's a huge point for people. If you're listening, go back, re-listen to that because I think that's a huge point and then soak it in because our position as strength coaches, right? Is we're a support role. We know that we recognize that. But we work, obviously, directly with head coaches, ATs, assistant coaches, players. So I kind of look at it as like you're kind of in the middle and you're communicating with everybody. And that doesn't mean everybody's communicating with you. And so 
it is your job, like you're saying, to go out and ask because you can never be faulted if you make the effort, you know? If you're like, hey, I just want to check up on this. Hey, I just want to, hey, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and it shows people you care. You know, I think that's a huge, it like shows people that you care and people can see that too. For sure. You know, um, so now that you have GAs and, and we kind of talked about this a little bit offline, but you have GAs, you know, it's a one year program for them, um, which a lot of masters are like that. Some are two year programs as, <laughs> as each year comes, what are some common trends you're seeing, whether it's with the quality of coaches or common problems that are, and every year I have to go through this again and again and again, and kind of how have you looked to overcome them? Yeah, I think just the, I've thought about this often actually, and I've been able to interview quite a few young strength coaches. Sure. Um, and there is a lot of young, bright, and I say young, I mean, they're only like five or six years younger than me. That's not that big of a difference. Yeah. Coming strength coaches uh, yeah. that can, really communicate really well in interviews um and they do a great job uh and as they deserve they end up getting a good grad assistant position because they'll turn me down and they'll go somewhere yeah. bigger um, sure that's that's been the one thing that i've been super impressed with so it seems like mm-hmm. there's a lot of you know really good uh, internships out there um but you know that's one of the things that i look for is like where have they interned who have they interned for if yeah. i can ever find a way to get you know, an intern from somebody that have I have a lot of respect for, um, and that's that's number one. So making sure that whatever you've done, whether it's experience at a high school somewhere, or if it's um, you know like a good quality, you know, Division One, Division Two, NAI, whatever internship that yeah. um, whoever I call, whoever your reference is, like they speak really, really highly of you, and um, they speak of your work ethic. Because uh, at the end of the day, the the you know if I bring a GA in, and I know they're going to be on time. I know they're going to, you know, interact with people really well. Uh, and I know that they're going to kind of be loyal and, and kind of operate with discipline. Um, then I can, I can lead them and guide them in any other area that they falter. If that makes sense. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's, that's a huge piece. Um, and then just one thing that's super important when we get here is we've already talked about is communication. You know, um, I remember again, as an intern, as a GA, as an assistant, even now struggling with, um, not wanting to bother people, mm. uh, but I would almost rather, uh, me tell a GA like, Hey, you know, you ain't gotta, you ain't gotta tell me all that versus have to go and seek that information from them. So I just make it clear. Um, I might not always have, um, your team on the front of my mind. But if something comes up, if you're modifying for injuries, uh, if, you know, we miss uh, our weekly staff meeting, like, please make sure that I know whether it's a text message that just says, Hey, you know, men's soccer lift uh, got canceled today for, you know, they had to practice instead or something. Just make sure that I understand that. Um, and then we just got to work together really, really well. And, you know, we've, the way that we've got it set up, we've got a small office um, in our football weight room. Um, yeah. You could probably stand on both corners and touch both corners with your arms. So that tells you how small. <laughs> and at sometimes there'll be five of us and a couple interns in there. So there's seven or eight people in that small little room. Um, yeah. So we've got to, work together well and if there's issues if there's friction we've got to hash it out uh that, that that just comes with trusting each other and spending time together and and knowing that at the end of the day um we're trying to work together for the athletes and it's about the mm-hmm. athletes it's not necessarily about us or, or 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 you know what we think at the end of the day so i think that's um you know it, when i was getting into the field one of the things that was a common theme was you know be ready to spend 12 hours with people right um not just people but like one or two people like in an office and and, and there's like a common question of like could you spend 12 12 hours with this person every day and then could you have a beer with this person and that was kind of like you know like are you a good dude or not (laughs) like are you a good girl or not right like because it's like man you know you're spending every day with these cats. And like you said, in an office where if you reach your arms out, you can touch each other. That's not that much space. right? Like, yeah. And so if there's issues that arise, if there are um, 
there's ambiguity, if there's animosity, if there's, you know, dis distaste, it's like that's felt quickly. Like you can't hide that, you know? Yep. No, I, I agree. And I think without a doubt when a lot of, so how we do our interviews is I usually have a, a phone conversation, yep. uh, pr perspective GA. Um, and then we have kind of a more formal interview uh, with all of our staff. And depending on the time of year, I, we might have all four GAs in there. We might just have one, we might just have two. But my directive to them is you need to interact with them and try to determine whether you could spend all day in an office with them. And even further, you know, they might even share a team together. So like with our baseball team, they've got to be able to uh, have two GAs with baseball to split it up, you know, pitchers and position players. They've got to be able to collaborate on programming. They've got to be able to communicate really well. Uh, but then they go to class and they have classes together. Um, yeah. One of them, the, those the guys that had baseball last year, they, they shared a house together. So these guys are around each other. <laughs> you ain't getting away from each other then. <laughs> they're, they're around each other all the time. Um, yeah. and, you know, sometimes you, you come in in the morning and they're a little bit more quiet than they normally are. And you realize like, hmm, might have been a little, uh, little quarrel at the house last night or something. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we had a really good staff this past year. And, and I think we always did a good job of um, kind of hashing it out and, and getting whatever was going on out there. And so that a student athlete or a coach uh, never knew if there was any kind of friction or anything. Uh, and I think it just helps us have that good working relationship, that trust uh, that you need on a staff. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think a lot of people's reality when it comes to kind of in that intern-ish GA role of like, yeah, I'm probably going to live with this person too. And, you know, it's just, it is what it is. So, okay. So with all the teams you have with, with GAs, with everything going on, I'm curious of, how do you focus on your programming with four weight rooms with, you know, sometimes football only or, or, or multiple teams? How does that kind of look for y'all? Um, and, and what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think everybody loves to like keep it simple, right? But, you know, what have you noticed with everything kind of spread out, if you will, um, that allows for things that you want to do or don't want to do? Yeah, I think um, number one, this is something I go back and forth with is like, do I try to box all of us in and say like, this is a, the general themes of how you should program, you know, uh, versus do you let a GA come in and that maybe is a little bit more knowledgeable with programming and, sure. and all that stuff kind of giving them more freedom. Um, and to be honest, I, I don't think I have this figured out yet. Um, yeah, yeah. I really don't have a solid answer, but um i can tell you our process is okay we know that you know you should probably follow a cns dominant order of sure training. you know you should probably do certain things before you do certain things um and i'm no expert in all that stuff but um as a general rule like there's just themes that i expect all of us to follow and then i ask that you know this is what we're doing right now like all of our gas should have mapped out um what their ideal semester looks like from an annual plan programming standpoint and ideal just you know outline of what each block three or four week block looks like and then you know if, if um you know we'll just use soccer as an example sure the soccer's coming up in the fall uh, i want to be able to look and see from for their in-season period from uh, november all the way back until august like what what is your ideal and then what my discussion with the GA will be is like, all right, so if a game schedule gets moved or it gets canceled or they've got two days versus three ga days between a game, um, what is the absolutely um, essential things that you need to get done and have a plan before you go into it for things that might need to be moved around? Or instead of spending two days, 45 minutes in the weight room, can you um, get half of that done in a pre-practice warm-up? Plyos. Can you bring some medicine balls out there and do some medicine ball throws uh, for power development instead of doing cleans or trap bar jumps or something like that? Um, be able to have, like, especially if, if we realize that they're really fatigued coming out. Yeah. Of the game, like, just because you have a set plan, especially in the in-season period, doesn't mean <laughs> it has to be a set plan. And I think that's yeah. one thing that a lot of GAs struggle with is, you know, sometimes you're going to have 45 minutes to lift on paper. 
but then the coach lets them out of practice 20 minutes late and you've only got 25 minutes. And with our situation, the cafeteria might close in 20 minutes. So what's more important than to lift that day or them to have plenty of time to get to the cafeteria and eat. Um, yeah. You've got to just understand, prioritize um, the right things and be able to pull and uh, adjust on the fly. And yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's a reality that, <laughs> so many struggle with man like and myself included myself included because what i like to do is i like to sit down with the coaches hey let's plan a month out right like i like to at least have plan a month out at least a month preferably a full semester hey we know like because we know our schedule we know when games are we know when we at least want to practice or at least we think we want to practice so let's put that, all that out there right let's <laughs> and i struggle with this so much too because i'm so militaristic i'm like boom not that i plans can't change because i recognize that they do change but hey let's get a structure let's get a base first because if we go from the base then we can go a hey, option one option two option three off of that but if we don't have a base and we're just chaotic i mean that's not and so um yeah, it's like, you know, you got to recognize what's most important at that point in time, you know, and if you're 22 and excited and gung ho per se, and, you know, you don't have the ability to take a step back, understand the big picture, like, okay, in the 90 day window, you know, that you have been training or that you're planning to train, if you, this one day is cut short because of X, how much does that affect? Well, it does it, it doesn't not, right? And, um, I think that's a, a reality for many, many current coaches and young coaches, not just like, just because you're an old coach doesn't mean you don't deal with that stuff. Like you definitely do probably still deal with that stuff. Well, yeah. uh, there's, there's there, at least once, you know, once every now and then, at least I'll realize that I've programmed two things that require a bench. I'm just like, well, oops, <laughs> now I got to adjust. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And that ties into the, um, you know, kind yeah. of facilities thing you were mentioning. I think we've done a decent job here of trying to make sure with all of our weight rooms, you could take just about any program that we write and do it in any weight room. You know, that's huge. So that was one thing when I first got here, we already had the weight rooms, but you know, there weren't trap bars in every weight room. There weren't medicine balls in every weight room. We didn't have access to bands in every weight room. Um, so those were the things after about a year or so that, you know, we don't have like a set strength conditioning equipment budget. Um, but, you know, historically the, the sports teams would have, um, you know, funds that could go towards those things. Um, equipment. So, yeah. yeah, equipment. Um, yeah. So, you know, about a year and a half in, I made a big ask to kind of all of our Olympic sports says, hey, these are all the things that would really help our training. Um, you know, could we could we find a way to get the money for that? And all of them obliged and ended up, you know, giving a little bit of money and that's helped us tremendously. Um, so, you know, maybe some advice to somebody is like, if, if you don't have a budget, um, and you know, I'm not, I'm not much of a fundraiser, but I'll do it if I need to, um, maybe just see if you can work with the sport coaches and, and show the value in, uh, having bands and, you know, maybe some teams give uh, a little bit more, maybe some teams give a little bit less, but you can get those essential things that, um, you need through the sport coach budget that have the donors or whatever, um, that will help your program. I think that's a huge thing. I think that's a, a larger reality for for the majority of coaches than what they realize. And that's one thing that probably goes unspoken, right? Especially, you know, everybody wants to be at a power five, which is cool. There's a lot of great things that go there and, and there's no issue with them at all. If you are not, which happens to be the vast majority of coaches, right? <clears throat> one of the things that becomes a real um, constraint, if you will, is financial dollars. Um, and then another thing that becomes very apparent is as a strength coach or the department head or whoever, you are the limelight of like starting the fundraising component of it and getting out into the community, speaking with the sport coaches, communicating with people like, here's what we need. Here's why we need it. Here's why it's important. Here's how much it's going to cost, right? Because you and I both know like the stuff that we have whether it's the top of the line or just what you need to get by isn't cheap right and when you have 
20 racks, 30 racks, 40 racks to fill, you know, and you're like, hey, uh, safety bar is like two to 300 bucks a pop, right? And then you're like, I got 40 of those. And that's just one item, you know, do the math. And you tell me like trap bars, pretty much the same price. I got 40 of them, you know, like, and maybe 40 is a large, but 20 is not. 20 is actually like, yeah, if you have one weight room, probably 20 is about right, you know? Um, and it all adds up rather quickly. And then you're like, holy cow, like, yeah, we're kind of asking for a, a decent chunk of change here. 10 grand doesn't go quite as far as you might think it does. Exactly. Everybody thinks, oh, we got 10 grand. It's like, cool. <laughs> like, no. we got two items, three items, you know? And it's like, yeah. oh, man, you know? You, you, so, and I'm not saying play the comparison game, and I'm not saying go and t- take everybody's money. That's not what I'm saying at all. But, you know, and I had this conversation the other day. It's like, you don't really, like, we talk about a constraints-based program or constraints-based programming or, or, or environment, but you don't really understand what that means until you're in a spot where you're like, yeah, so we don't have that. Mm-hmm. You know, like, cool, you're going to program med ball throws every day. Well, you have three med balls, and you <laughs> have 50 athletes. Yep. So are you going to program med balls? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But you don't really understand. It doesn't become real until you're in it, you know? Exactly. Yep. And, or you think that, hey, everybody needs to time their sprints every week or, um, <laughs> you know, we need to do this and that test on a weekly basis for readiness. Like, well, if you've got four teams training at the same time, then not everybody can do that, you know? So, yeah, you're spot on there. Yeah, it's – it's uh. It's just interesting. You know, you just, it doesn't mean your program. That's why it's really funny because if you go online and you look at somebody and they, they shoot a glimpse of their, their program, right? Like, okay, okay, cool. Whether it's a video, whatever. And then you got all these people that are hating on it. Oh, this, 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 and that. And I'm like, do you even understand like the thought process that went into that? Do you even understand like why they did it in that particular way? Let alone to your point earlier, did you reach out and ask them like, Oh no, you didn't. You're just going to blindly. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, I don't know about that, but it's uh, it's so crazy to see um, from from that from that standpoint, you know, for sure. But um, so with y'all, let me ask this question because I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, more so like design of both weight room and practice facilities. Are some of your weight rooms connected to or? across the street of like a football field, practice field, or the basketball courts or the volleyball courts or anything from that standpoint, the way, the the reason why I'm thinking of this is it's like, if I was to design something, if I was to build something, I would want to say court sports are, the weight room is next to the courts. Football is next to the indoor practice facilities, potentially game facilities, depends upon what you have. So then we walk right out this door and we're on the field or we walk right out this door and we're on the court. Um, soccer similar, baseball similar, right? Because then, hey, we can do more quote unquote sports specific stuff, but you're always on the surface in which they're going to play. Doesn't mean you always have to be, but you have the ability to then just walk right in and walk right out. Like transition time is eliminated tremendously. I think that's one thing that we've got it made, to be honest with you. Um, Mm. You know, we've talked at length about our four weight rooms, but like our football facility, football only weight room, 16 racks, so we can train half our team really comfortably, plus a, you know a lot of open space. Um, the transition time that I allot from the football field, which is literally right across a little path, or a football indoor, um, I allow eight minutes. And usually guys are in there ready to go with their with their lifting shoes on in like five, you know. Uh, so it's super super fast. Um, our another weight room that we have is just for men and women's soccer. They so they have a men and women's soccer indoor turf area. Wow. Um, like little indoor small sided games and scrimmage and stuff in there. Wow. Um, and you go through behind a, a goalie net of one of those and there's a six rack weight room right there. Um, so there are these double doors that we can open up and we'll do all of our plyos, all of our jumps, yep. all kind of just, yep. um, you know, locomotion exercises on the turf and they can hop, uh, hustle in the weight room and do anything they need to do at the racks or with their dumbbells or anything like that. Um, so that's, we've got it made there. And then our basketball weight room is, is really the same thing. Men and women's basketball and volleyball have a weight room that's right next to their practice courts. It's sandwiched between practice sports and the game courts. Um, so we've been in a situation with that one before where, um, you know, schedules got moved around. Volleyball yeah. and basketball are supposed to lift at the same time. And there's only five racks in there. 
So we have power blocks on like rolling carts. We roll the power blocks out. We roll the benches out and volleyball trained out on the basketball court while basketball was able to do everything they need to do at the barbells. Um, each spent about 15 minutes and they switched. Uh, so it opens it up. Like, yeah, we've, we've got it, definitely got it made. And then our last weight room is right next to just like a little small patch of turf uh, that track and baseball and softball and golf and tennis use. Um, so if we're doing sprint stuff or warming up, we can hustle in and out of the weight room really fast. So uh, that's never been an issue. Um, it's actually been probably one of the most convenient things that we take for granted around here. That's, I mean, yeah, that is uh, very convenient. You know, that's a great way to describe it. That That is, I'm going to say, very ideal, right, yeah. where maybe three sports are training out of one particular weight room. And it's funny because all the sports then like, they claim it as their weight room too, you know, and I love that. They're like, this is the football weight room. This is the basketball weight room, right? And it's great because like they own that space. And then if somebody is in there that's not a part of those programs, everybody's like, why are you, are you sure you should be here? Like, yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to see, you know? And I mean, all that would not be possible if it wasn't for like our donor support and like just the alumni support. I think, you know, from a student athlete perspective, having been a player here, Sure. Um, the experience that you have when you're student athlete here, the way that the coaches care for you, um, you know, the way that just the way that Harding is, um, you want to give back because you felt like, you know, you felt like your experience here has been so impactful in your life. And yeah. so if you go into our football in indoor facility or if you go into our football weight room, um, you see a list of all the people that are former old Bisons that have given back to the program. The same is true. Uh, for the soccer program, for men and women's basketball, for baseball, for softball. People, you know, when they come to play here, they feel like, man, like I want to give back to that program because of the impact that those coaches and because of that university had on me. Um, yeah. I think that's something that's kind of unique uh, about Harding that you know, even at TCU, uh, being a private school, I feel like it, it was it was there, but not near like it is here. Sure. Uh, that makes sure. us unique compared to a lot of other places. Yeah. So then when you were an athlete and you didn't have a strength coach, how did y'all train when you were an athlete? Or was it just like that guy came and volunteered essentially? Or what did that look like? Yeah. So um, we had a strength coach, um, you know, but he was also the, you know, special teams coordinator or like the yeah. you know what I mean? yeah. you know, probably like it is still at a yeah. lot of places. Like there's one and he was kind of designated it as the university strength coach. And I'll be sure. honest. You know, Coach Beeson was the strength coach when I first got here, and he also did special teams and a secondary coach. Like he was, he he had it, he had he did it right. Um, he had a CSCS. Um, sure. I learned a lot from him, and he was only here for a year, um, and then he moved to a, a different role in the university. Um, but you know, really on that, like I had, I think three different, three different strength coaches in my time, uh, in my four and a half years playing here. Um, so anytime that there's turnover, uh, there's going to be some changes to programs. There's just going to be some variety there. And so probably the biggest thing was just, I, I never felt like I was on a consistent, um, progressive program for my entire playing career. You know, it would be one thing for a year and a half, another thing for a year and a half. And then, uh, yeah. the last train coach was, was coach Moat, who's still here as the defensive coordinator. Uh, and he, I mean, he had a fantastic program. Um, we got big and we got strong and all the things we needed for football. But again, I, it, was, it was only about a year, you know. So sure. um, I think, you know, if I could go back and, and have it ideal, then some type of progressive program where yeah, kind of foundational, like learning how to move, even though right. you know I like to lift, I still probably could learn how to move and sprint and all those things when I was a freshman that yeah. built up to maybe more of the advanced stuff. Um, yep. When I was a senior, like what we currently do would have been more valuable. And so, okay, taking that, um, because I think that's a reality a lot of places. There's, you know, coaches tend to bounce around for a multitude of reasons, you know, a year or two or, or, or three years at max, and they bounce, right? And three years, I would say, is actually pretty solid, right? But um, given your guys' situation now with, you know, GAs coming in yearly, how do you kind of, to an extent, help reduce that so your current student athletes aren't going through a similar thing that you know you went through right for the betterment of them to say hey look like yeah. here's our left and right limits with programming completely understand that there's a variable because 
my thought process might be different than yours, so it's going to be slightly different. I might call an exercise something different, whatever. How do you kind of help reduce that, though, with for your current student athletes? Yeah, and I think that's something that ties into what we mentioned earlier about, um, you know, how much autonomy do you give your graduate assistants versus yeah. um, how much do you try to, you know, kind of manipulate what they're doing? Um, because at the end of the day, you know, it's about the student athletes first. And although yeah. I'm trying to develop really high quality graduate assistants that go on to be fantastic right. student coaches, it's about the student athletes. Yeah. Um, and that's that's just a discussion that we have on the front end. Anytime that I have a say or, or, or want something to go a certain way, which is it's not often that I'll say, like, you have to do something this way. Um, yeah. It's about the student athlete, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as far as like exercise naming goes, like exercise names are going to stay the same. Um, sure. It kind of ties back in like there's certain a structure of, of training that from year one to year two, um, by and large, you're going to do the, the fast explosive stuff first. You're going to do the string stuff next. You're going to do the hypertrophy size stuff next there's going to be some times where you get outside of that um we're gonna you know condition similarly we're not going to do anything that uh isn't safe um yeah list goes on and on you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) and then the other thing that you got to consider is you know probably more than half of our student athletes go home for the summer and do nothing and do nothing yeah, and, I mean, and, and we've got Team Builder, and so you can see when the last time somebody logged on was, and I went and looked, and, like, there's some students that haven't even been on since, like, February, you know, um, <laughs> and because, like, they had, a, a you know, their season or whatever. Um, so, really, for a lot of our students or a lot of our student athletes, um, they need to start from just a basic fundamental movement first program when they first get back almost every year. Yeah. Now, for some that have done that for multiple years in a row, they can probably maybe go a little bit heavier. Uh, but a first introductory block where just like movement is the priority, uh, that's probably kind of a standard. And that's something that I talk about um, for all of our GAs, you know. Yeah. And generally, yeah. you're going to work towards a little bit less volume and a little bit more intensity. You know, that's right. just everybody probably does that in some way or form. Right. Um, so that's probably how, um, not probably, that's kind of how we progress things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, when we get into the season, all of our sports seasons, they end up being so hectic that um, they've got to be adaptable. So they just have to have a certain template uh, and you try to follow the template the best you can. But, you know, they've got to understand they need to be flexible with like, you know, some days you're not going to have time to do your five sets of three on squats. You might need to adjust. And then instead of it being a front squat at 75, 80 percent, maybe you've got to adjust and do just goblet squats for the day because it ends up being the day before or after a game or what, or yeah. what, you know what I mean? Yeah. That was like me the other day we were, uh, we were squatting and, and I was um, not, our movement competency and quality was not to where it needed to be. And so I had like front squat, this was a couple of weeks ago, but I had like front squats for the, the next couple of weeks. Cause that was kind of my, my progression. Right. And I was like, scrap that. No, no more front squats. We're going all goblet squats again because I was just like, I don't even care about weight. I don't care about any of that. I literally care about movement competency and hitting the range of motion that we should be hitting. And, you know, then we took a step back to go forward, but we then did goblet squats for the next three weeks and we went heavier and, you know, all that stuff. But I was like, hey, look, like if you can't hit the ranges of motions, I don't care to load you. You know, because what am I doing then? You know, like, cool, no, boosting my ego, potentially causing an injury. Like, that's just not smart. So, yep. yeah, I mean, I could just, just completely scrapped and said, we're not even going to barbell. No. You know, I figured I'd say, hey, let's try it. I want to see where they're at. And I'm like, nope, we're not doing that. Mm-hmm. And, and I tell our GAs, like, I would rather you see the first day or two of the semester and realize that you have done way too little. Yes. Then be like, oh shoot! Like this golfer that's never been in the weight room doesn't need to back squat. You know, Correct. we can't even. Correct. They can't. They don't even know what a barbell is. You know what I mean? Um, or they haven't touched yeah. the bar in six months. So they don't even know where to put the J hooks to ensure it's at the right height for them. You know, it's like okay, so we got a long way to go. In reality, at the end of the day, it's it's about the athlete and it's about the sport that they play, and yep. they're here for that sport. They're here to, to play football or they're here, here to play soccer or golf, whatever it is. And, you know, we could probably be air on the side of too little versus too much. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. 
Michael, where can people find you online? Uh, so Twitter, Instagram, I think my Twitter is just my name, Michael Gregg. Instagram, it's mdgregg50. My last name is G-R-A-G-G. Um, you know, that's that's those are probably the best resources right there. Yeah, man, that's awesome. And uh, if you're looking to be a graduate assistant, if you're looking to go learn from somebody in the, uh, that's really, really good in the business, man, hit them up because you're always looking for them. You can learn a lot. You get a fantastic coaching experience. Obviously, you, you talked a lot about the facilities, talked a lot about, you know, the, the amazing stuff that you have there, which sets people up for success. And honestly, it might even be better than some place that they go afterwards. And then they're like, crap, we don't have this, you know? Like, we didn't even we didn't even talk about the the force decks that we have the GPS yeah. units that we have the, the velocity based units that we have yeah so if you want to come here's my pitch if you want to come learn how to be a strength coach even if you think you you know how to be a strength coach uh, I promise you you will come here you will learn you will grow you will develop uh, you will be better because your time's been here um, yeah. that's my pitch to you heck yeah you have everything that um i'm gonna say higher levels have you know what i'm saying uh probably at a better setup than them as well um there's a lot of facilities that are across the country you know and i noticed that cool you have a nice logo but your setup is not good you know um you don't have vbt you don't have team builder you don't have you know some of the other stuff that makes life easier mm -hmm. and uh that's a huge component to things like how can you make your life easier with systems that's the biggest thing create systems and processes to make your life easier and and, and it gets easier i promise you it gets way easier you know no doubt about it but man i want to thank you for your time man um for coming on today and just kind of talking a little bit about how you kind of got to where you are not only from a professional standpoint but the, the growth of where you're at at harding the growth of what you guys got going on there um, I appreciate you and what you put out consistently online as well. And, and so um, I just want to let you know, you know, that I appreciate you and your time and, and, and thank you for being on my man. You bet. Thank you, Kendrick. I appreciate the, the time, the opportunity. Hope some, some people find some value in this conversation and, but like you said, share it and uh, let's, let's grow this, uh, let's grow this podcast, huh? Yeah, man, we're doing well. We're doing well. So yeah, guys, if you guys would, Hey, just like Michael said, do us a huge favor, share the show, man. Uh, it's the only way the show grows. It's on a pure value exchange. If you think we did well, show the show. If you didn't think we did well, don't show the show then. But I know we did a really good job. So do us a huge favor, share the show, guys. So, all right, guys, we'll catch you on the next one.